，拿茶是英国的皇家院、皇家、皇家的院士，然后呢？他主要做的做的研究在在相变化方面，不管是我们我们假如你念材料学，就是呃马丁散铁啦，或者变刃铁啦、扁硬铁类，就相变化，他是是一派的宗师了，所以所以是说这个是是是非常非常有名。那我刚才提过，在学校其实我们听过他，那他也是他有他有两百多篇的这个 publication， 然后他也是他有几个 journal 了哈。呃，赛车的 technology of oil in the journey 那个那个杂志的主编了，对吧？然后他呢是英国的皇家院士，啊，他现在是剑桥大学，但他的专主要教授物理研究的 physical m e t h o d o l o g y 方面。啊，那今天他会来，他来这里大概呃，今天和明天都会在这里。那今天会给我们一个 talk 叫呃 s e v e r e l y d e f o r m e d skills， 就是说呃，就是比。呃，大量变形的钢铁嘛，目前这样翻译啊。那明天也会有一个 Bach 的 Metal c r y s t a l l i z e Steel， 明天上午。啊，他他会给我们两个 talk。那今天除除了除了除了呃，马来西亚教授以外呢，还有呃杨振明教授，他他们有很很好的合作。那他杨教授也是非常有名的前辈。那我想，我接下来会请杨教授做一点抄，因为他，他跟应该他有时政关系吧？哦，可以可以，我们再请杨教授。那我先先先请教授。哎，各位先生啊，还有一位小姐啊。哈哈。今天非常高兴能够在这边啊，这个旁边是法律学做个补充，然后我想我大概讲几句英文就好了。啊 ，Ladies and gentlemen， 啊 ，It's my great honor. To take this opportunity to introduce uh, my supervisor. Uh, I was in Cambridge in 1984 to 87, and at that time, uh, my supervisor taught me lots of beautiful concepts. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I use this concept uh, in my university. So you can find the best engineer, Dr. Chai So. <laughs> First of all, I should emphasize, uh, Professor Patricia is uh, worldwide famous in the field of physical technology. And he's the most generous professor in the world I ever met. So please ask a question as possible. If you ask a lot of questions, you will learn a lot. If you don't ask them, <laughs> you learn very few. Should we start the talk? Okay. okay, so uh, do I need a microphone? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, first of all, let me thank you very much for those kind of introductions. Okay. And thank you all for coming here because I know how busy you are making some really exciting things and starting spin-off companies and so forth. It's very, very impressive what you do. So thank you for spending your time to come here. Today I'm going to talk about uh, severely deformed steel. And as Professor Yang said, please interrupt me and ask questions at any time. Any time at all. Just interrupt and ask a question if I say something you don't follow. What do we mean by severely deformed? Well, I'm talking about true strains ranging from something like six to nine. Now, what does that mean? Supposing I take uh, 50 grams of iron and I stretch it out into two kilometers, then that's a true strain of about nine. So it's very, very large deformation. I'd like to acknowledge that, uh, you know, obviously many people have contributed to the work that I'm going to show including Professor Yang at uh, the Taiwan National University and uh, his student who is now uh, Dr. Wang and uh, a colleague Hiroshi Harada at the National uh, Research Institute for Metals in uh, Japan. My talk is uh, going to be in two parts. The first part will deal with a case where the starting material has two phases and the deformation actually mixes the phases up so that it becomes a single phase. 
And the second part will be about starting from a single phase, and the deformation leads to the formation of another phase. So there are two different stories, but related to each other. And I will show you that uh, the study of these severe deformations leads to a really nice theory. And that theory makes predictions which are applicable even in other materials. And I'll give you an example where the theory has explained a phenomenon which has gone unexplained for many, many decades. Okay, so there are several parts to the talk. And I hope that we can get some help from MIRDC on a future experiment that we are planning because we've made a prediction, but we do not have the equipment in NTU or in Cambridge to actually do the experiment. And we know that you have the equipment. Right, so first of all, let's just uh, think about how strong iron can be in theory. Okay. If you go back to 1956 and just look at pure iron, okay, without any alloying additions, etc. if you make a single crystal, which is about one micrometer in size, then you can already in 1956 get a strength of 10 gigapascals, 10,000 megapascals. That's very, very strong material. But unfortunately, as you increase the size of the crystal, yeah, the strength collapses. Because in this case, the strength is coming from the fact that there are no dislocations in the material. So, you have to really pull the atoms apart to break the crystal. As soon as we make the crystal large, the probability of getting defects increases, and therefore the strength collapses towards the normal sort of strength levels that you see in iron. So to achieve very high strength, you mustn't rely on perfection, because as soon as you make the material uh, larger in size, uh, the strength will collapse. The same applies to carbon nanotubes. They're very, very strong when they are of the order of nanometers in size. As soon as you make them to one millimeter in size, their strength is much less than that of steel. Okay? And this is a fundamental science of scale. And you will not be able to make a perfect carbon nanotube which is large. Okay? So you will never be able to exploit the strength of a very tiny carbon nanotube in a larger sample, because thermodynamics says you must have defects in your material. Okay. So this is not the way in which we might get a strong material. Instead, if we deform the material severely, so instead of getting strength by making the material perfect, we actually get strength by putting many, many obstacles in the way of deformation, then you can get a material which is strong and insensitive to size. So here, for example, is steel wire, which has been severely deformed. And you can see that the strength can be five and a half gigapascals. And it doesn't decrease as you increase the size of your sample. Whereas this is the original single crystal material. You can see how sensitive this is to size and how insensitive this is to size. So how is this uh, wire actually made? Well, you start off by making a steel which is austenitic. So it's, it's basically about 0.15 weight percent carbon, one manganese, one silicon. Austenitize it, punch it to margin size. Okay. You then uh, raise the temperature again in between the AE1 and AE3 temperature. That means you're in a two-phase field of austenite and ferrite. Okay, so that's intercritical and in and then you crunch again, so you end up with a mixture of ferrite and martensite. So it's a dual-phase steel. The kind of steels that are going into cars, because they are high strength. They're of the order of 700 megapascals in strength. So here you have ferrite. And here you have martensite, which is much higher in carbon. Because the ferrite has almost zero carbon in it. The martensite will have much more carbon, because the carbon has gone into the oxygen. You take this material, it has a microstructure which looks like this. This is a martensite and this is a ferrite. So there's nothing very clever about the microstructure. But we are going to take it and we are going to severely deform it. Now, in order to study the severely deformed state, you need very high resolution. 
because you're going to introduce so many defects that it becomes difficult to observe what's going on. And of course, you can use high-resolution transmission electron microscopy, or you can use field ion microscopy. Field ion microscopy is illustrated here. You make a very, very sharp needle. And on an atomic scale, that needle won't be sharp. It will look something like this. It will be blunt. But it's still very sharp from our point of view. You then apply a large electrical field to it, and that allows the atoms to follow the trajectories of the electrical field, and you form an image over here with a magnification of more than 10 million. So you can see individual atoms. But the second characteristic of this is that when you pull out the atoms from the specimen by applying an electrical pulse, you can measure how long they take to fly between two points. And from that, you can say, okay, this is carbon, or this is hydrogen, this is iron. So this is time of flight mass spectroscopy. So you not only have atomic resolution, you can see atoms, but you can also chemically analyze individual atoms. Okay? So this is a field ion microscope atom probe. And when you look at that steel wire, which has been strained, to a true strain of nine. It looks like this. A single dot there is one atom. Okay, so we are looking here at atoms, and you see these circles here, these circles. Those are actually planes of atoms, because if I go back here, you can see that this plane of atoms will image as a circle, because it's at the tip of a needle. Yeah, everyone happy with that? So these are planes of atoms, we can see what the structure of the material looks like. The thing that I want you to notice, which is very interesting, is that, look, there are these dark regions here. You see some dark boundaries, where it's difficult to see the atoms. Those boundaries, uh, those uh, dark regions, are actually interfaces. What we've done by severe deformation is we've reduced the size of the crystal to something like 5 to 10 nanometers. By having this huge deformation, the grain size has decreased enormously. Furthermore, we had this region of high carbon martensite and low carbon, uh, uh, low carbon ferrite. The severe deformation mixes up those two phases. Here I'm plotting the concentration of silicon in the material. And, you know, it shows these variations, but those variations are not real. They're variations because we are picking out small numbers of atoms. Yeah, so if I pick out just 50 atoms, uh, then the composition of that will be different from the next 50 atoms. It's just like you've got elections going on at the moment, yeah? If you go and pick out five people, they might all be voting for one party, and you might say, okay, 100% of the population is going to vote for this party. That's not correct. Yeah, we have to take account of statistics. So these variations are not important. We can show that the material is homogeneous by showing that the variations follow a binomial distribution. What I'd like you to notice is that the average composition of the steel is this. So the silicon is homogeneously distributed between the ferrite and the martensite, even though we did the intercritical annealing. It's because this mechanical deformation has mixed the phases up. Similarly, the manganese is evenly distributed between the ferrite and the martensite. And surprisingly, if you look at the carbon, although the ferrite has less than the average carbon concentration, it still has quite a large carbon concentration forced into it by mechanical deformation. So we truly are mixing up the martensite and ferrite in the solid state. We started off with almost zero carbon ferrite, and we've introduced carbon by breaking up the martensite and mixing it with the ferrite. Uh, this is how much carbon the ferrite should really contain under equilibrium conditions. So we are far in excess of the equilibrium concentration of carbon. So this is like the process of mechanical alloy, where you start off with elements, you deform them severely, and therefore they form a solid solution. If we look at the free energy of body-centered cubic iron, 
Okay, so here we are plotting the free energy of ferrite and the carbon concentration. This is the starting ferrite and this is the margin site with a much higher carbon concentration. What this diagram shows is that if I mix them up, then I actually get a reduction in free energy. So it's favorable for the margin site to lose some carbon and for the ferrite to gain some carbon during this process. And that's the reason why we get this mechanical mixing, even though the whole deformation is happening at room temperature. You get a reduction in free energy if you mix up the margin site and the ferrite. So just to summarize, uh, this is the starting composition in atomic percent. And this is what we find experimentally, that the ferrite has gained quite a lot of carbon from almost zero, which we expect at equilibrium. The manganese and silicon are more or less the same as the starting manganese and silicon concentration. So let's now think about where the strength of this material comes from. We've got five and a half gigapascals measured strength. Well, the most effective strengthening mechanism is grain size. If you can make the grain size fine, then you can achieve huge strength, strength as long as the grain size is very, very fine. Because strengthening due to grain size varies with one upon the grain size. Uh, now, you're all thinking probably this is wrong because we know that the whole patch equation says that the strength should vary with d to the minus a half. But when we get to this small a grain size, that equation doesn't apply, and it should vary with 1 upon the grain size. So when we get to a very small grain size, the strength increases very sharply. Uh, so if we do a calculation of strength according to the grain size we have measured here, which is 10 to 15 nanometers, then we get a huge contribution to the total strength from the grain size itself. So you can see here that I expect to see something from 3.3 to 5 gigapascals of strength coming just from the fine grain size due to the severe deformation. Now, of course, uh, there is an, uh, a strength coming from the iron itself even if it didn't have any microstructure, it would have a strength of about that much. Uh, the solid solution strengthening very small contributions. The carbon would contribute something like 800 megapascals if it was completely in solid solution. So we are getting our strength mostly from the grain size effect. That we have reduced the grain size to 10 to 15 nanometers, and that is causing a major increase in strength. If carbon was actually contributing that much, we would get a much higher strength level in our steel. But it is likely that some of that carbon is precipitated. I'll show you some evidence. Now, one of the advantages of having a very fine grain size is that you don't lose ductility. If I increase the strength by forcing carbon into solution, then the ductility decreases. The material becomes brittle. Here you can see that even at this strength level, it's very ductile and you can even tie a knot with it. You couldn't do this with carbon fiber. If carbon fiber has zero ductility uh, and a strength of about three gigapascals. These are just some results to show you that we don't fully understand uh, a, a couple of features. When we do a lot of chemical analysis on an atomic scale, we find some regions which have a very high carbon concentration, about 50 atomic percent. So that's more carbon than in cementite. Yeah, so there's something strange going on, which we don't as yet understand. It's possible that it's some kind of precipitation, but there's no carbide which has 50 percent carbon in it. Yeah. But we, we have repeatedly found some regions with a very high concentration of carbon. So this is an unsolved problem at the moment. Okay, so before I go on to the next part, do you have any questions about that particular high strength steel wire? Okay, if not, then we can carry on and uh, we can take questions at the end. Okay?
but please interrupt if you have any questions. Well, this uh, this is a stainless steel wire, okay? and you know it looks almost like hair. And when you touch it, you know it feels like hair as well. It's incredibly fine. It's some, something of the order of uh, eight micrometers in size. And I I was first introduced to this wire by Professor Yang at NTU. Um, if you look at it at high magnification, it's made by deforming 316L stainless steel. And this is one strand of the wire, so it's approximately 8 micrometers wide. And the detail that you see here is simply the scratches that exist in the die when you do the drawing. Okay, so this is just one single thread of stainless steel wire. And it's 316L. 316L has almost no carbon in it. And it's got a, around 12% nickel, 18% chromium, and 2 weight percent of molybdenum. So again, it's made by starting with uh, a, a rod and then drawing it out until you get a true strain of 6 in this case. So uh, this is just to repeat the chemical composition of the steel. And this is the way in which... Uh, Professor Yang's student prepared the sample in order to examine it in a transmission electron microscope. Now this is a very unusual way of making a specimen because we are starting with an 8 micrometer wide wire. So there's no question of making a sample, electro polishing it and so forth. It's just too small to do that. So what they've done is something very clever. Is they've put the, silic uh, the wire between two chips of silicon and then sectioned it so that you get a flat section of the wire, cut it, and then simply ground it down to produce a thin enough specimen to do transmission electron microscopy. Very, very clever method of preparing a specimen for transmission electron microscopy. First time certainly that I have come across it. Uh, this is what the material looks like before the deformation. So you can see that the grains of austenite are equiaxed. That means they have the same dimensions in all directions, whether we look at the longitudinal section or in the transverse section of the wire. Okay, so this before the deformation. And this is what it looks like after very severe deformation. So this is the transverse section where you see almost equiaxed grains. But when you look in the longitudinal section, we see very severely deformed grains. So in three dimensions, this is like cylinders, which are packed together. Okay? Because look, this is the cross section, and this is the longitudinal section. The deformation has made this into very, very, very long cylinders, which fill space. And if you look at uh, the orientations of these grains, they are random, because in the electron diffraction pattern, you've got circles. Yeah, that means you've got grains in many, many different orientations. It's like a, a powder diffraction pattern. But if you look on this section, then you've almost got a single crystal here. Yeah. You know, this is a spot pattern, meaning that there isn't much misorientation between these crystals. So it is strongly crystallographically textured sample because deformation produces texture. Now, of course, uh, austenitic stainless steel, I will show you, and, and of course it is well known, that austenite is not the stable phase at room temperature. It is a metastable phase. All these austenitic stainless steels are not really stable austenite. They want to transform to ferrite, but by cooling rapidly, we retain all the austenite and we get a fully austenitic steel. So if you deform it, then you give a chance for the austenite to transform. Okay. The stress and the strain helps the austenite to undergo phase transformation. And the transformation that happens is it goes to mitocyte. So this is the longitudinal section again. If you take a dark field image of austenite, then you can see these are long, we see long grains of austenite because the region here has the same orientation as the region here. 
if we now take a dark field image of Martin's eye, then we don't see continuous cells, but we see discrete cells, because each grain of austenite can transform into many, many different orientations of Martin's eye. So even though we had a, a strongly crystallographically textured material, we, when it transforms, we can remove that texture effectively by forming many, many grains of martensite in different orientations. Extremely difficult microscopy. This is the X-ray diffraction pattern. Before the deformation, you can see it's fully austenitic material. Yeah. Even though thermodynamics will tell you it shouldn't be austenite. 316L shouldn't be austenite at room temperature, but it's because you cool it sufficiently rapidly, you make it fully austenite. After deformation, uh, you get these lines due to, uh, due to the margin site forming. So, the reason for doing X-ray diffraction was to get a quantitative number for how much margin site we have. And if you do a detailed analysis of these patterns, then there's about 57% of martensite formed after a true strain of six. So very, very severe deformation, and it's only transformed to 57% of martensite. You would have imagined that you would get a lot more martensite after such a severe deformation. So that is a little bit puzzling. Why have we got so little martensite after so much deformation? Well, let's have a look at thermodynamics. Okay? Uh, if we do an equilibrium phase diagram calculation for 316L, equilibrium means the ferrite will have the composition that it wants to have. That means it will reject nickel. Yeah? The austenite will have the composition it likes. That means it will reject chromium and become rich in nickel. And we might even have carbide precipitation, for example, M23C6, chromium carbide or cementite, etc. If you do that calculation, then according to the equilibrium calculation, uh, sorry, this is equilibrium here, we should have very, very uh, little austenite at room temperature, only about 18% of austenite. But it's very unlikely that at room temperature, you can get diffusion of chromium and nickel. It's impossible. Yeah, it would take many hundred years for chromium and nickel to distribute between the austenite and martensite. So we, we need, need to do a different kind of calculation where we allow equilibrium, but we don't allow the chromium, nickel, and the large elements to move. And that's called para-equilibrium. So this is the para-equilibrium calculation. If we do that, then we should get 100% austenite at room temperature. Okay. Now, our results show that neither of them are correct. Okay. We are not following equilibrium. Uh, if we were following para-equilibrium, which is the real situation, then we should get 100% of martensite at room temperature. And experimentally, we've only got 57% of martensite. So there's something strange going on. According to thermodynamics, we should get 100% martensite, but experimentally, we've only got 57% martensite after doing a huge amount of work on the material. Only 57% of martensite. Why is that? Well, if we go back and look at the literature, many people have done experiments in which they deform 316L and look at the formation of martensite. So these are results from the published literature where we are plotting the strain here. Uh, and these are fairly small strains going up to one. And this is the amount of martensite. And according to this, the amount of martensite should increase if I increase the strain. Yeah. You can see that. And if I just look at these days, then I get a curve which looks like this. It should just continue increasing as I increase the amount of deformation. But the experiments done at NTU show that the curve levels out like this. So we end up with only 57% of martensite after a huge strain. 
this set of results and this result are contradictory. Okay. And there's a further contradiction that margin size is a displacive transformation. That means that the interface is a coherent interface with the oscillator. If you put obstacles in the way of the coherent interface, then it will no longer move. So there is a well-known phenomenon known as mechanical stabilization, in which if you deform the austenite, then you retard the Martin City transformation. These results are inconsistent with that. Here we have an acceleration of the transformation as we increase the strain. Okay. So there are two contradictions. First of all, the NTU results show that we haven't got enough margin size, even after a huge amount of strain. And the second one is that the early work shows an acceleration of transformation, whereas we expect deformation in the austenite to retard the transformation. Okay, so why is this happening? Well, the first thing we did was we didn't want to draw any lines by ourselves on all those data put together. Yeah? We want a mathematical method which will automatically identify what the relationship should look like. Okay. And that method is called uh, neural network analysis. So we didn't bias the method in any way. And if I take these data and this data point and present it to a neural network, it produces this curve. And that curve is very exciting. So we have not biased this curve in any way. We have not suggested that the curve should be of that shape, but the neural network identifies that it should be of that shape. And the reason why it's exciting is that it predicts that if the strain is less than 2, then we don't have mechanical stabilization. If the strain is greater than 2, then it doesn't matter how much I strain it, I will not get transformation. So our prediction is that this is where mechanical stabilization begins. Later on I will show you the theory we have developed independently to show that we should get mechanical stabilization at the strain of about 2. But of course we don't have any experimental data here. And this is where MIRDC could help us to deform this stainless steel wire to intermediate strains between 6 and this. We've already made the predictions and published them. So we are, in English we say we are sticking our neck out, yeah, like this. And if we are wrong, then it gets chopped. Yeah. So we, we need this kind of excitement to do research, take a risk. So we made the predictions, published, that we should get mechanical stabilization at a strain of about two. And we need to do the experiment. Okay, so let's, uh, let's now develop a physical theory which predicts when we should get mechanical stabilization, when plastic deformation in the austenite should retard the margin city transformation. Well, first of all, let's imagine we have some dislocations in our material, and the dislocation density is rho. Yeah. And the Burgers vectors of the dislocation is B. And L is the distance which a dislocation can move before it hits an obstacle. Okay, so it's the free path that a dislocation can move. Then if I apply a stress and the dislocation move a distance L, then the plastic strain will be epsilon. So this is just normal plasticity, where the strain that I expect, if I have that many dislocations, that's the Burgers vector and that's the distance that they move by. Okay. Now, the shear stress that is required uh, to move past a forest of dislocations, given this dislocation density, is related to the shear modulus, G, the Burgers vector, Poisson's ratio. So again, this is standard dislocation theory, that if I have a dislocation density of rho, then I need the shear stress of that much to move past the dislocation. So this is the equation for plastic strain, and that's for the stress. I can combine those two equations uh, and get this one, which relates the stress to the mean free distance of a dislocation. So there's nothing new here. These are just the two equations combined together, because if you look, they have the common factor rho. So if I just rearrange this, then I get the shear stress as a function of the mean free distance and epsilon. 
And this, uh, this mean free distance depends on the grain size that we have, which is uh, given by this capital D. So this is simply from the literature. Okay, so we now have an equation for the shear stress, that means the stress required to move the dislocations as a function of the grain size through L and of the plastic strain. Now why am I working out the stress required to move dislocation in this jungle of dislocations and boundaries? Okay. The reason why I'm working out that stress is because we've got a Martin-Side austenite interface and it has to push against these dislocations. If it cannot overcome those dislocations, Martin-Side cannot form. Okay. So the theory is that if the driving force which pushes the Martin-Side austenite interface is not large enough, then you will stop Martin-Sidic translation. So this is the first ever theory for mechanical stabilization. So this is the stress required to push against dislocations, which we have introduced by deforming the wire. And this is the stress that pushes the interface because the austenite wants to transform. This is the free energy change when austenite transforms to Martin side. So we have two stresses. One is the stress required to overcome dislocations, and one is the stress which is pushing the Martin side austenite interface because there's a free energy reduction when austenite transforms to Martin side. If we balance those two, we can predict the strain at which we should get mechanical stabilization. Okay. Is everybody happy with that concept? Just don't worry about the data. All we are doing is we have two stresses. One, we've got a jungle of dislocations, and we've got to get past that. So we are working out how much do the dislocations resist the movement of the interface. And what is driving the interface is the difference between the energies of austenite and martensite. So we can work out the stress which pushes the transformation interface. So it's an incredibly simple theory, and it's very surprising that nobody has thought about this until now. So all we have to do is to balance those two stresses and we can work out the strain uh, required for mechanical stabilization. And this is just to illustrate to you the numbers that we put into the theory. There, there are no adjustable numbers here. So we have the shear modulus of austenite, the Poisson ratio, which is standard from the literature. We have the Burgers vectors of dislocations and the grain size parameters. Okay? So this is the starting grain size of about 40 micrometers. And we have tested this theory because in this theory we can also vary the chemical composition of the steel. Yeah? Because that will alter the driving force for transformation. So supposing that I make hypothetical alloys, alloys 1, 2, 3, and 4. They're all based around 316L, but with different nickel concentrations. Yeah? We're starting from 6, 8, 10, 12. And this, this alloy 4 is almost exactly like 316L. But what I want to discover is not only the strain at which mechanical stabilization happens, but what if I alter the nickel concentration? Will the mechanical stabilization happen at a later strain or an earlier strain? Because we have that delta G, which is the driving force for transformation from austenite to martensite, that depends on the composition. So in this theory, we also can change the alloy completely and predict a new strain for mechanical stabilization. So it's very powerful. So bear in mind that here all I'm doing by altering the nickel concentration is making martensitic transformation more difficult because as I increase the nickel, the austenite becomes more stable. So delta G, uh, the driving force here, decreases when I increase the nickel concentration. So I have alloying element effects in this theory. Uh, this is just 316L, the exact composition that was used in the NPU experiments. And this I'll come back to later. This is a completely different steel. Okay. And I'll, I'll show you how the theory we developed here applies to a completely different problem. It's very exciting. Okay, so this is just to illustrate how the driving force varies with temperature. 
of course, the other exciting thing is that we also have temperature in this theory, because if I alter the temperature, then the driving force changes. So the stability of the austenite and martensite change as I alter the temperature. Austenite becomes more stable at high temperatures, more difficult to have martensite at high temperatures. So if you focus on just these four lines here, forget about the points, then you can see that by altering the nickel concentration from 6 to 12 weight percent, I make the austenite more stable because delta G decreases. By increasing the temperature, I also make the austenite more stable. Okay. Delta G decreases. These points are for the exact composition of 3167. And I just want to show you that it's, it's almost identical to this alloy here, which is of an idealized composition. So this goes into the theory. And there are no adjustable parameters here. The thermodynamics is well established. We just plug in the composition and we get delta G. So there's absolutely no adjustment done here. These are the numbers which go into the equation for the stress to drive the interface. And here are the predictions of the strain at which mechanical stabilization will happen. Uh, this is for the four different ideal alloys and this is for 316L. And Room temperature is around here, and according to this, at room temperature, I should get mechanical stabilization at a strain of about 2 in 316L. At room temperature, I should get mechanical stabilization at a strain of about 2. If I just go back a few slides, that's the problem with using animation is that when you want to break out of it, it's difficult.
you get a dark color because there is a lot of detail inside that feature which scatters light so that the light doesn't go back into your eyepiece. Okay. So what this optical micrograph shows is that although we are, this appears to be a homogeneous single plate, there is actually much more detail inside there. If I take that plate and I look at it in a transmission electron microgram, then it's quite amazing. You know, it consists of thousands of small plates. So what appears optically to be a single plate actually has thousands of tiny, tiny, tiny plates. Okay. And the really strange thing about it is that, uh, so this, this is the plate we are looking at here. If I look at the size of the small plate here, okay, it's the same as the size of the small plate here. So what's happening is that you form a small plate, for some reason, it completely stops growing. Then you form another plate, another plate, another plate. And if you look at them at a poor resolution, like an optical microscope, that appears to be a single plate. Now, Many, many years ago, we suggested that the reason why this is happening is that the transformation causes plasticity in the austenite, and that stops the interface by mechanical stabilization. I mean, it stops to grow, because you've introduced so much, so many defects in the austenite that the interface between the bainite and austenite cannot move. And if you look, at a, look closely at the interface between bainite and also you can see a huge array of dislocations, tangled dislocations. So basically they are stopping the interface from moving. So for the transformation to pro progress, you have to form a new plate. Yeah. And that's what's stopping it. Now let's see if we can predict the strain required to stop that bainite transformation. Because we know that when bainite forms, the plastic strain is 0 0.26, okay? We can measure that yep. using, uh, if we polish the austenite completely flat and form bainite, then the surface is tilted, and that strain is 0.26. So we are not making any adjustments in the theory. It's the same theory as 316L. And the micrographs I showed you were for transformation at a temperature of around 500 Kelvin. And, uh, sorry, transformation for a temperature around 620 Kelvin, okay, 410 degrees centigrade. Yeah. And according to this, the strain at which you should get mechanical stabilization, in other words, the plate should stop growing, is indeed around 0 0.26. Furthermore, this shows that if I lower the transformation temperature, then the strain would be larger. In other words, the plates will be longer. Anyway, and that's exactly what we observed. So without making any adjustments at all to the theory, we've explained quantitatively a feature that we have speculated about qualitatively okay, in the past or many, many decades, and explained why we get this mechanism by which a plate starts to grow, it stops, you have to nucleate another plate, and it progresses in a step-by-step -step mechanism. So that we find very exciting. So that's the end of this lecture. I think I would be really happy if you ask me questions. I have a question. Uh, first of all, uh, or I think the magnetic transformation between uh, transient and uh, austenitic stainless and is totally different. For example, if, uh, if we want in the, the plane carbon steel, the magnetic transformation comes from uh, when we cool it down from overnight or from high temperature into low temperature. It's, uh, it comes from um, a super uh, fast cooling, okay? And then, the magnetic transformation in uh, austenitic stainless steel comes from uh, cold rolling and uh, it's called cold deformation. So that I think the 
uh, the mechanism of transformation is totally different. And uh, this is the first of all. Um, and from the, the data yeah, you quote from uh, Professor uh, Moore, I think uh, we, because he is specialized in the uh, TEM in investigation of analysis and transformation. But actually, and we can say, uh, we can see that uh, in this data, the volume, the volume percentage of uh, uh, Martin site is very low, and I think it's uh, some, it's some mistake because he, this, uh, this, uh, this amount is calculated from. I I, I don't know the, what 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 the quantity, but actually, normally we more than, uh, for example, eighty percent, for example. So that the their, their data is, I think, the, is is a lack of, uh, is not so. I think it's too small. Right. Yeah. So that, I, normally we say that in the magnetic transformation in Austinidium stainless steel, uh, there's no, no the, no limit in the for the in the for example your uh, mechanical stabilization because uh, the mountain side is uh, which uh, is the stress is too high so that in normally if we uh, draw the wire then actually if we can uh, draw the wire severely then is uh, the the quantity of mountain side is actually is increase right yeah the reason why we can cannot get uh, for example, one hundred percentage of mountain side is because the wire is too strong, so that we cannot uh, draw anymore. Right. So, so several very good points. Yeah. Uh, and you know, you started off by saying that the mechanism of transformation is different in a plain carbon steel, where you quench to get mountain side. So it's it's driven by supercooling of the austenite. And in the case of uh, deformation induced martin side, uh, it's the strain which is causing the martin side to form. Yeah? Now, the mechanism is different, but only in the following way, I think. Uh, the nucleation of martin side in a deformed material is enhanced by the defects, yeah? especially by intersections of slip bands, for example. Uh, whereas in the case of the thermally cooled mitosite, we have very few defects in the austenite and it normally starts off at the austenite grain boundary uh, uh, arrays and so forth. Yeah. However, the actual atomic mechanism is identical, that you, you generate the mitosite by a displacement of the austenite crystal structure. And that atomic mechanism is what controls the, whether it gets stabilized or not, because it requires a coherent interface. If the interface encounters a lot of defects, it loses coherency and then stops. Yeah? So, in this context, the difference in the mechanism, I think, is not important. Yeah. Your second point about the data from the Moore's published work, you know, if you look at those data, he actually gets 0% transformation when he does the tensile test but he gets more transformation when he does a more complicated deformation like you know, uh, uh, rolling and something else that he did. And that just indicates that you know, uh, we, there's a lack of nuclei for modern side and the deformation introduces those nuclei. But his measurements are done using X-ray and that should be accurate. That should be accurate in giving the volume fractions. And what three papers, I think, consistently show is that the deformation increases the amount of modern side at, below, at strains below one, which is what he has used, an equivalent strain below one. Whereas we have gone to a strain of six, and every method that you would use to fit the data together will show that it must level out, that means mechanical stabilization is happening. So, so I agree with you, there are subtle differences in the mechanisms between strain-induced 
and uh, thermal mounted sites. But from the point of view of interface coherency, it must be identical. Mm -hmm. Very good question. Any other questions? Another question about the uh, the cipher. Yeah, the cipher here was uh, it was developed uh, developed by Co. Yeah, and it's it's almost I think that it's um, it's a philosophy of uh, every design in that uh, to have a, a door face. Yeah, of uh, of the end of the uh, mountain side, side and. Uh, and so that it's, uh, it's I think, um, in my experience that it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, they developed this kind of steel and for many years. And, uh, but you just, uh, you ju I think you uh, published this paper more than 10 years. Yes. And, uh, and so what happened but, uh, during these 10 years? Yeah. Uh, what happened was the stainless steel wire. Yeah, it brought back a lot of memories. So what we want to do, you see, always is to look at the entire set of evidence and to look at the differences between, let's say, stainless steel and non-stainless steel. Mm -hmm. Over there, we start with two phases which are mixed up, which is a, and it's a process which is favored by thermodynamics because take high carbon martensite, low carbon ferrite. If you produce an average composition, you actually get a reduction in free energy, which was very surprising. Uh, you know, I mean, it's not surprising after we've done the calculation, but it was surprising before. This is a case which is the stainless steel wire is completely different, that we are actually inducing a transformation, but we're not getting enough transformation because of mechanical stabilization. Mm -hmm. So you're right, there's a, a big gap between the cipher work and the work on um, stainless steel. But inside that gap, we actually developed a, another theory, which I haven't presented today, which is a beautiful theory. Uh, it is a whole lecture, and it's the first uh, theory of mechanical alloying. Because, you know, effectively, the deformation of cipher is taking two different things and mixing them in the solid state by deformation. And we started to think about that, and we've got a, a paper which is called the evolution of solutions. So it, it solves uh, some very fundamental problems in thermodynamics of solutions. And I, I'd be happy to give you a copy of that paper. I have a, uh, actually a more interest about the Interfacial structure between in the dual phase steel because I, I uh, there seems there's nobody uh, has a detailed research about this and because this uh, this kind uh, I think that the main reason is that this was invent, uh, invented by by Cole and they don't do not release uh, many many uh, material in the world so that. Uh, nobody, uh, there are so, not so many people uh, study this uh, in the visual structure uh, between, especially uh, between mountain side and uh, ferrite. That's right. So, so they actually uh, provided us uh, provided us with the material to do the detailed work. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, from their point of view, I mean, like like many industries, yeah, all they want to do is produce a wire and to sell it. You know? yeah. So they did some transmission electron microscopy, and also the purity of the material has to be high to not fracture during the drawing, things like that. Those are very, very important things that they did. But we did the atomic characterization and the interpretation in terms of thermodynamics and so forth. Yeah, what, what, uh, what's the major, uh, what's the major 
problem for the Cyprus deal could be commercially available. It's just expensive. Too expensive. <coughs> yeah. uh, I mean, you can buy it if you pay a lot. It is commercially available. Okay. But you have to pay much more than carbon fibers oh. to have it. So, so there are some applications for cutting uh, silicon, for example, you know, so that you don't waste a lot of, of the silicon. It's very thin, that sort of application. But you couldn't make uh, a rope. It, is, it would be too expensive. Fishing line. Uh, fishing line. <laughs> okay, fishing line. That's good. So you get, uh, you know, their their first product was a fishing line, actually. But I th I think that's cheating, yeah. Because if you introduce technology into sport, then it's no longer a sport. You know? yeah, if the fish can't see the fishing line, that's not fair. What I have is a wood. Tiny question. Oh, we know that you have done many uh, inve investigation of TEM, uh, so that you have many uh, TEM photographs. And in the di uh, digital time, uh, how do you transform uh, the, uh, the slide into into digital image? Uh, do you have do you use a drop scan or something else? It's a very good point. You know, I mean, I took five thousand photographs on the DM for my PhD yeah. back in 1979. And when I use them again, I scan them in because they are negatives, not uh, electronic. And we, nowadays it's very useful to have electronic format, so I mm -hmm. scan them in. Mm -hmm. But the scanner you use is the, uh, the normal scanner or drum scanner? Uh, it's a normal one, it's not a drum one, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. What are the resolution that you need to for such kind of scan? The resolution? Uh, uh, 600, 600 or 1000? No, you see, I think uh, I, I have been using 400 dpi. Oh yeah, that's really enough? Answer. It seems to be enough, but... Okay. Uh, <laughs> but I think ideally, you're right, it should be done properly, but it would take a huge amount of time. You know? Oh yeah, right. Uh -huh. yeah. So it's only when I want to reuse the figures that I actually scan them in. And then I also put them onto our website. Uh, okay. yeah. Thank you. Uh, is cyber sensitive with temperature? Cyber. Uh, I don't think that anybody has studied that. What we have done is a tempering experiment. So uh, after the deformation, we temper it at about 300 degrees centigrade. Uh -huh. You know, we tried to investigate what that 50% carbon region was. Mm -hmm. uh, and it didn't disappear after we did a heat treatment at 300 degrees centigrade. Mm -hmm. So we're still puzzled about what, what it is, but we have done nothing more than that for temperature sensitive. Thank you. Do you have an application in mind? <laughs> ultra thin motors or? Motor. Okay. We, we had uh, uh, Professor Yang and I were contacted by uh, Swiss Rolex mm -hmm. watchmakers. You know the uh, very expensive watchmakers? Sure. Yeah. Uh, they, they, they wanted uh, to use the wire. Mm -hmm. in their watches. So there might be a very expensive application. <laughs> <laughs> For what purpose? More, more accurate? Or what? Why? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> really. okay, uh, try to find uh, what's the strong material and of, of course consider the toughness and grip property as well. So that is in progress. Hopefully we get a free sample of the watch. <laughs> <laughs> we know that you have told many about the strength between the uh, sensation with the 
是那个跟静压体声的朋友有一些联系啊，之前因为静压体声可以做大量的学习，如果它能够应用在那个 l o w b a n d 的手表的话，就很值钱。Any more questions? Can I ask a question? Uh, in your opinion, uh, how much the grand size can be reached? In the metal, I mean the smallest, smallest, small yeah. <laughs> In your opinion? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it is a very good question. Yeah. Um, what I can do, I, say, I can give detail tomorrow, but here, here is how it, uh, how you could do a calculation. So, as you make the grain size smaller, you put a lot more energy in the material because interface takes energy. So supposing that we have this much interface area for unit volume. If I multiply that, so this is the interface area for unit volume. If I multiply that by the uh, by the energy of the grain boundary per unit area. And that gives me the energy that's required to create grain boundaries. So the amount of surface per unit area is equal to Q over the grain size. So I can, I can just write the energy required to create a small grain size is 2 sigma divided by L. Now when L becomes very, very small, this becomes incredibly large. So it depends on your process. If, if your process is able to provide more energy, then you will be able to get a finer grain size. But there are further problems. Is that if you actually provide more energy in your process, a lot of it will disappear as heat. If you can't get rid of that heat, then it will raise the temperature of the material, and that makes it into a coarser grain size. So we've, we've actually published uh, a paper on the theoretical size to be expected. Yeah, the question? Yeah. No. Okay, so we can say thank you very much for your very informative <laughs> lecture. My and you, can, if you have any question, maybe you, uh, because it's a professor, but for us, yeah, we will be here, so we will be here tomorrow. You can bring your question here tomorrow. I'm sure he will be very happy to answer your question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you again.